Chapter number 16 of Curiosities of Olden Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter 16. Sordis Sacre. It is not an uncommon case nowadays for pious persons at times of great perplexity to seek a solution to their difficulties in their Bibles, opening the book at random and taking the first passage which occurs as a direct message to them from the Almighty. The manner in which this questioning of the sacred oracles is performed is serious. A considerable time is previously devoted to prayer, after which the inquirer rests from his knees and consults the family Bible in the way described. Whether such a manner dealing with the word of God be under any circumstances justifiable, I do not pretend to judge. St. Augustine, in his 119th letter to Januarius, seems not to disapprove of this custom, so long as it not be applied to all things of this world. Gregory of Tours tells us what was his practice. He spent several days in fasting and prayer, and in strict retirement, after which he resorted to the tomb of St. Martin, and taking any book of scripture which he chose, he opened it and took his answer from God, the first passage that met his eye. Should this passage prove inappropriate, he opened another book of scripture. The eleventh chapter of Proverbs, which contains thirty-one verses, is often taken to give an omen of a character of a life. The manner of consulting it is simple. It is but to look for the verse answering to the day of the month on which the questioner was born. The answer will be found in most cases to be exceedingly ambiguous. The practice of consulting certain books for purposes of augury is of high antiquity. Herodotus speaks of the custom and of the fraud of Oxmocratus, a celebrated diviner who made use of Musius for reference, and who was driven out of Athens by Hipparchus, son of Pisistratus, because he had been detected inserting in the verses of Musius an oracle predicting the disappearance in the waves of the islands near Lemnos. Homer, and afterwards Virgil, were the poets most frequently consulted, but Euripides was also regarded as divinely inspired to foretell the future. Two hundred years after the death of Virgil, his poems were laid up in the temple of Prosenest for consultations. Alexander Severus sought the oracle in the region of Heliogabalus, who feared and hated him, and the line of Virgil he read told him that if he could surmount opposing fates, he would be Marcellus. The emperor Heraclius, when deliberating where to fix his winter quarters, was determined by an oracle of this sort. He purified his army during three days, and then opened the Gospels. The passage he found was understood by him, to indicate that he should winter in Albania. Nisiphorus Gregorus relates how Andronicus the elder was reconciled to his nephew Andronicus in consequence of lighting on the verse of the Psalms. When the Almighty scattered kings for their sake when they were as white as snow and salmon, whereby he concluded that all the troubles that had been undergone by him had been decreed by God for his purification. With the same intent during the consecration of a bishop and the moment when the book of the Gospels was placed on his head, it was customary to open the volume and gather from the verse at the head of the page an augury of the prelate's region. This is illustrated in a curious ancient painting of the consecration of St. Thomas a Becket by Van Eyck, shown in the Leeds Fine Art Exhibition of 1868. Chroniclers and biographers have not failed to mention several prognostications given in this manner, which were verified in the event. At the consecration of Athanasius, nominated to Patriarchate of Constantinople by Constantine Porphyrogenitus, a patriarchate which he stained with his crimes, Carpella, Bishop of Nicomedia, having brought the gospel, says the historian Pachimiris, the congregation prepared to take note of the oracle, which would be the opening of the book, though this oracle is not infallibly true. 
The bishop of Nicaea, noticing that he had lighted on the words, prepared for the devil and his angels, groaned in the depth of his heart, and putting up his hand to hide the words, turned over the leaves of the book and disclosed the other words. The birds of the air come and lodge in the branches, words which seemed far removed from the ceremony which was being celebrated. All could be done to hide these oracles was done, but it was found impossible to conceal the truth. It was said that they did not forbid the consecration, but that nevertheless they were not the effect of chance, for there is no such thing as chance in the celebration of the sacred mysteries. Landry, elected bishop of Leon, said Gilbert de Noget, received episcopal unction in the church of St. Rufinus, but it was of sad portent to him and the text of the gospel for the day was a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also after many crimes he was assassinated he was succeeded by the dean of orleans whose name is not known the new prelate having presented himself for consecration people looked to see what the gospel would prognosticate but it was open at a blank page as though god had said i have nothing to foretell of this man because he will be and will do nothing and in fact he died at the end of a very few months gilbert tells a story of himself which shows that the same practice was in vogue at the installation of an abbot on the day of my entry into the monastery he writes a monk who had studied the sacred books desired i presume to read my future at the moment when he was preparing to leave with the procession to meet me he placed designatedly on the altar the book of the gospels intending to draw an omen from the direction taken by my eyes towards this or that chapter now the book was written not in pages but in columns the monk's eyes rested on the middle of the second column where he read the following passage the light of the body is the eye then he bade the deacon who was to present the gospel to me to take care after i had kissed the cross on the cover to hold his hand on the passage he indicated to him and then attentively to observe as soon as he had opened the book before me on what part of the pages my eyes rested the deacon accordingly opened the book after i had as custom required pressed my lips upon the cover whilst he observed with curious eyes the direction taken by my glance my eye and spirit together turned neither above nor below but precisely towards the verse which had been indicated before the monk who had sought to form conjectures by this seeing that my action had accorded without premeditation with his intentions came to me a few days after and told me what he had done and how wondrously my first movement had coincided with his own thomas cantipratensis relates how the cardinal conrad archbishop of paris was in doubt as to what reception he should give to the order of preachers some members of which had lately entered the city he hesitated as to their having been legitimately constituted and questioned their value whereupon he betook himself to prayer and then going to the altar opened the missal at the words laudere benedicere et predicare whereupon his scruples vanished and he extended to them the right hand of fellowship i know a religious man who had designed to serve god in the secular life writes patichuli he once poured forth his prayers to God, and asked that he might be permitted, if it was his will, to fulfill some desire or order that he had. Having asked the opinion of certain persons of authority, he was recommended, after the most sacred service, to open the missal and take note of what should first arrest his attention. He followed this advice, and lo, the first words presented themselves to him were those of our Lord to the sons of Zebedee, in St. Matthew chapter twenty three ye know what not ye ask from which he gathered clearly that were his wishes to be gratified his eternal welfare would be imperiled i have heard of a young man in doubt as to his vocation for holy orders when he found his desire strongly opposed by his parents inquiring of his bible in a similar spirit and manner and reading he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me I have been told of another man in somewhat parallel circumstances, having lately awakened to religious convictions after a life of great laxity, who sought guidance in the same manner and read, 
Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. A story of the baleful effects of this practice among Scotch Presbyterians appeared in a collection of Legends of Edinburgh by a recent writer. The story related how a designing mother persuaded her reluctant daughter into a marriage with a wealthy but dissipated youth, the son of their employer, towards whom the girl felt great repugnance, by manipulating the sortis sacre as to the make the girl read, Behold, Rebecca is before thee, take her and go, and let her be thy master's son wife, as the Lord hath spoken. As the name of the young woman was Rebecca, the sentence seemed to her to be a message from heaven. Gregory of Tours mentions a couple of instances of omens taken from scripture. The one was that of Shram, who had revolted against his father, Clothair, who had marched to Dijon, where he consulted the sacred oracles by placing on the altar three books, the prophets, the acts, and the evangelists. In like matter, according to Gregory, Morobius, flying from the wrath of his father, Chilperic, and Fredegunda, placed on the tomb of St. Martin three books, the Psalter, the Kings, and the Gospels, and kept vigil throughout the night, praying to the blessed confessor to discover to him what was to happen to him. He fasted three days and continued incessantly in prayer. Then he opened the books, and one after another, and was so dismayed at the replies which he found, that he wept bitterly beside the tomb, and then sadly left the basilica. In 1115, differences having arisen touching the elevation of Hugh de Montagu to the bishopric of Auxerre, the case was brought before Pope Pascal II, who decided in favor of his consecration and ordained him himself. It was urged by his friends in his favor that on the opening of the book above his head during the ceremony, these words stood out at the head of the page. Ave Maria, gracia plema, and this was regarded as a token of his chastity, humility, and exemplary piety, and of the favor in which he was held by the Blessed Virgin. According to the use of the ancient church of Teruan on the reception of a new canon, it was customary to open at random the Psalter, after that the volume had been sprinkled by the dean with holy water and the paragraph at the head of the page was transcribed in the letters patent of the new canon the same custom was in force as late as last century in the cathedral of bologna and the bishop de langle tried in vain in seventeen twenty two to abolish it the bolandists relate that saint petrock of cornwall when in doubt whether to undertake a pilgrimage to the holy land or not was decided by opening his Bible at the passage of Isaiah. Et erit sepulchrum ages gloriosum. A similar story is told of Saint Papo, a Belgian saint of the 11th century. The anecdote is well known of King Charles and Lord Falkland consulting the Sortus Virgilante in the Library of Oxford. The lines they met with, and which were so singularly verified afterwards, are marked with their initials on the book, which is still preserved. Rebelius refers to the Sortes Virgilante when he makes Panurge consult them on the subject of his marriage. Gregory of Tours sat at heart because of the desolation produced by the ravages of Count Ludaste in and around his city, entered his oratory and as he tells himself full of trouble i took up the psalms of david in hopes of finding when i opened the book some verse which might bring me consolation and i found this he brought them out safely and they should not fear and overwhelmed their enemies with the sea gregory relates another story akin to the subject clavis at the moment when he was marching against alaric king of the visigoths sent his deputies to the church of saint martin at tours saying to them, Go, and maybe in the holy temple you will find some presage of victory. After having given them presents for the sacred place, he added, O Lord God, if thou art on my side, if thou art determined to deliver into my hands this unbelieving nation, hostile to thy name, grant that I may see thy favor, or the entry of my servants into the basilica of St. Martin, that I may know if thou dignest to be favorable to thy suppliant. 
the envoys having hastened to tours entered the cathedral at the moment when the presenter gave out the antiphon thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle thou shalt draw down mine enemies under me thou hast made mine enemies also turn to their backs upon me and i shall destroy them that hate me hearing this they gave thanks to god presented their offerings and returned with joy to announce the omen to their king Divination by scripture has also been forbidden by several national councils, probably on account of the superstitious use made of it. The 16th canon of the Count of Vannes held, held in 465 forbids clerks under pain of excommunication, consulting the Sortis Sacre. This prohibition was extended to the laity of the 42nd canon of the Council of Agde in 506. Eloquanti clerice sive lesse student auguris et sob nomine fictis religious pures cas sanctorum sortes vocen divinations scientiam profodor et quorantium scriptorium in inspectione futura prominent. It was also forbidden by the Council of Orleans in 1511 again by that of Auxury in 595, and by that of Selinkstadt in 1022, by that of Einham in 1009, and by a capillary of Charlemagne in 789. Related to Sorts Sacre are those messages which are supposed by the conveyed by the chance hearing or reading of a passage of scripture. These are not, however, to be regarded in light of superstition and it is quite possible, and indeed probable, that certain texts accidentally meet with may influence for good or bad those who are in a disposition of mind to be so affected. The well-known story of St. Augustine's conversion is to the point. He relates himself how sitting in a garden house in great trouble of mind, he heard a voice say, Tole lege, whereupon he took up the sacred scriptures and read not in chambering and wantonness not in strife and envying but put ye on the lord jesus christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof saint anthony was moved to the assumption of the religious life by accidentally hearing if thou wilt be perfect go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me St. Louis, when trying a murder, was much inclined by his natural tenderness of disposition to pardon the man, but his resolution to let justice take her course was strengthened by opening his psalter at the words, Vece judicum et justinium. But to conclude, the true use of holy scripture is best learned from our English collect, which asks that we may read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest its glorious lessons. Taken as a whole, and not ring disjointed directions for conduct from stray passages. End of section 16. Chapter 17 of Curiosities of Olden Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2012. Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gold. Chapter 17. Chapa Chocolate. Gage, the Dominican, a great admirer of chocolate, a man who combated with all his energy the objections which medical men of the 17th century made to its use, derived its name from atte, the Mexican word for water, and the sound it makes when poured out, choco, 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 choco. Oh, Professor Max Müller, what do you say to this? Whatever the derivation of the name may be, the composition of the beverage is well known. Cacao, sugar, long pepper, vanilla, cinnamon, cloves, almonds, maize, aniseed are the main constituents, and the cake chocolate used in Britain is believed to be made of about one-half genuine cacao, the remainder of flour, or Castile soap. 
we are not going any further into the mysteries of its composition which may be ascertained from any encyclopedia for our business is with a circumstance in connection with its history probably known to few and first for our authority the aforementioned dominican thomas gage was born of a good family in england his elder brother was governor of oxford in sixteen forty five when king charles retreated thither during the great rebellion whilst still young thomas had been sent to spain for education and had entered the dominican order and having been like so many spanish ecclesiastics fired with missionary zeal he embarked at cadiz for vera cruz whence he betook himself to mexico near which town he made a retreat previous to devoting himself to a life of toil in the philippines however the accounts he received of these islands were so discouraging and the monastic life in mexico was so inviting that he postponed his expedition indefinitely but gage had no intention of spending his life in ease he hurried over the different districts of mexico and guatemala making himself acquainted with the languages spoken wherever he went and he laboured indefatigably as priest to several parishes of great extent gage's account of the cultivation of the cacao and the manufacture of chocolate is interesting his treatise on its medical properties conceived in the taste and spirit of his day curious and his personal narrative lively and amusing one little statement must not be passed over chocolate it seems is useful as a cosmetic creole ladies eat it to deepen their skin tint just on the same principle observes gage as english ladies devour whitewash from the walls to clarify their complexion chapa was a central point for gage's labours during a considerable period at that time it was a small cathedral town containing four hundred spanish families and one hundred mexican houses in a faubourg by itself the cathedral served as parish church to the inhabitants one dominican and one franciscan monastery besides a poverty-stricken nunnery supplied the religious requirements of the diocesan city no jesuits there quoth gage with a little rancour those good men seldom leave rich and opulent towns and when you learn the fact that there are no jesuits at chapa you may draw the immediate inference that the town is poor and the inhabitants not liberally disposed <laughs> liberally disposed the high and stately creole dons who claimed descent from half the noble families of spain the grand representatives of the de solis cortez de velasco de toledo de serna de mendoza who lived by cattle jobbing and by pasturing droves of mules on their farms and who gave themselves the airs of dukes and were as ignorant and not so well behaved as the donkeys they reared who ate a dinner of salt and kidney beans in five minutes and spent an hour at their doors picking their teeth wiping their moustaches and boasting of the fricassees and fricandeaux they had been tasting these men liberally disposed they contributed nothing to the treasury of the church but gave the clergy considerable trouble these creoles particularly disliked and resented any allusion to their duty of almsgiving and the request for charity was by them regarded as a personal affront gage was soon intimate with the bishop don bernard de salazar a very worthy prelate perhaps a little wee bit too fond of the good things of this present life but otherwise most exemplary very energetic and as bold as a saint in reforming abuses which had crept into the church talk of abuses and you may be sure that woman is at the bottom of them a certain tsar whenever he heard of a misfortune at once asked who was she knowing that some woman had originated it the same view may perhaps be taken of abuses and corruptions in the church dom bernard de salazar had the misfortune to live in a perpetual state of contest with the ladies of his flock and the subject of dispute was chocolate it was a brave struggle bravely fought on both sides the prelate fulminated all the censures at his disposal in the ecclesiastical armory 
The ladies, on their side, made use of all the devices and intrigues stored in their little heads, and gained the day, of course. Now, the great subject of altercation was as follows. The ladies of Chapa were so addicted to the use of chocolate that they would neither hear low mass, much less high mass, or a sermon without drinking cups of steaming chocolate and eating preserves, brought in on trays by servants during the performance of divine service, so that the voice of the preacher, or the chant of the priest, was drowned in the continual clatter of cups and clink of spoons. Besides, the floor, after service, was strewn with bonbon papers and stained with splashes of the spilled beverage. How could that be devotion which was broken in upon by the tray of delicacies? How could a preacher warm with his subject whilst his audience were passing to each other sponge cake and cracknels? Bishop Salazar's predecessor had seen this abuse grow to a head without attempting to correct it, believing such a task to be hopeless. The new prelate was of better metal. He commenced by recommending his clergy, in their private ministrations, to urge its abandonment. The priests entreated in vain. Very well, said the bishop, then I shall preach about it. And so he did. At first his discourse was tender and persuasive, but his voice was drowned in the clicker of cups and saucers. Then he waxed indignant. What, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? The ladies looked up at the pulpit with unimpassioned eyes while sipping their chocolate, then wiped their lips and put out their hands for some confit. The bishop's voice thrilled shriller and louder. He looked like an apostle in his godly indignation. Crash! Down went a tray at the cathedral door, and everyone looked round to see whose cups were broken. What was the subject of the sermon? asked masters of their apprentices every Sunday for the next month, and the ready answer came, Oh, chocolate again? After a course on the guilt of church desecration, the bishop found that the ladies were only confirmed in their evil habits. Reluctantly, the bishop had recourse to the only method open to him, an excommunication, which was accordingly affixed to the cathedral gates. By this, he decreed that all persons showing willful disobedience to his injunctions, by drinking or eating during the celebration of divine service, whether of mass high or low, litanies, benediction or vespers, should be ipse facto excommunicate, be deprived of participation in the sacraments of the church, and should be denied the right of burial, if dying in a state of impenitence. This was felt to be a severe stroke, and the ladies sent a deputation to Gage and the prior of the Dominican Monastery of St. James, entreating them to use their utmost endeavours to bring about a reconciliation and effect a compromise, a compromise which was to consist in Monseigneur's revoking his interdict and in their continuing to drink chocolate. Gage and the prior undertook the delicate office and sought the bishop. Salazar received them with dignity and listened calmly to their entreaties. They urged that this was an established custom, that ladies required humouring, that they were obstinate, the prelate nodded his head, and that their digestions were delicate and required that they should continually be imbibing nourishment, that they had taken a violent prejudice against him, which could only be overcome by his yielding to their whims, that, if he persisted, seditions would arise which would endanger the cause of true religion, and, finally, the prelate's life was menaced in a way rather hinted at than expressed. "'Enough, my sons,' said the bishop with composure. "'The souls under my jurisdiction must be in a perilous condition when they have forgotten that there must be obedience in little matters as well as in great.' Whether I am assaulting an established custom or a new abuse matters little. It is a bad habit. It is sapping the foundations of reverence and morality. 
God's house was built for worship and for that alone. My children must come to his temple either to learn or to pray. Learn they will not, for they have forgotten how to pray. Prayer they are unused to, for the highest act of adoration the church can offer is only regarded by them as an opportunity for the gratification of their appetites. You recommend me to yield to their vagaries. A strange shepherd would he be who let his sheep lead him, a wondrous captain who was dictated to by his soldiers. As for the cause of true religion being endangered, I judge differently. Religion is endangered, but it is by children's disobedience to their spiritual legislators and by their own perversity. I am sorry for you, my sons, that you should have undertaken a fruitless office, but you may believe me that nothing shall induce me to swerve from the course which I deem advisable. My personal safety, you hint, is endangered? My life, I answer, is in my master's hands, and I value it but as it may advance his glory. When the ladies heard that their request had been refused, they treated the excommunication with the greatest contempt, scoffing at it publicly and imbibing chocolate in church, on principle, more than ever. Just, says Gage, drinking in church as a fish drinks in water. Some of the canons and priests were then stationed at the cathedral doors to stop the ingress of the servants with cups and chocolate pots. They had received injunctions to remove the drinking and eating vessels and suffer the servants to come empty-handed to church. A violent struggle ensued in the porch and all the ladies within rushed in a body to the doors to assist their domestics. The poor clerks were utterly rooted and thrown in confusion down the steps, whilst, with that odious well-known clink, clink, the trays came in as before. Another move was requisite, and on the following Sunday, when the ladies came to church, they found a band of soldiers drawn up outside, ready to barricade the way against any inroad of chocolate. A stern determination was depicted on the faces of the military, that if cups and saucers did enter the sacred edifice, it should be over their corpses. The foremost damsels halted, the matrons stood still, the crowd thickened, but not one of the pretty angels would set foot within the cathedral precincts. A busy whisper circulated, then a hush ensued, and with one accord the ladies trooped off to the monastery churches, and there was no congregation that day at the minster. The brethren of St. Dominic and of St. Francis were nothing loath to see their chapels crowded with all the rank and fashion of Chapa, for with the ladies came money offerings, and they blinked at the chocolate cups for a consideration. This was allowed to continue a few Sundays only. Our friend the bishop was not going to be shelved thus, and a new manifesto appeared, inhibiting the friars from admitting parishioners to their chapels, and ordering the latter to frequent their cathedral. The regulars were forced to obey, not so the ladies, they would go when they pleased, quoth I, and for a month and more not one of them went to church at all. The prelate was in sore trouble. He hoped that his forward charge would eventually return to the path of duty, but he hoped on from Sunday to Sunday in vain. Would that the story ended as stories of strife and bitterness always should end, so that we might tell how the ladies yielded at length, how that rejoicings were held and a general reconciliation effected, but the historian may not pervert facts to suit his or his reader's gratification. On Saturday evening the old bishop was more than usually anxious. He paced up and down his library, meditating on the sermon he proposed preaching on the following morning, a fruitless task for he knew that no one would be there but a few poor Mexicans. Sick at heart, he all but wished that he had yielded for peace's sake, but conscience told him that such a course would have been wrong, and the great feature in Salazar's character was his rigid sense of duty. He leaned on his elbows and looked out of a window which opened on a lane between the palace and the cathedral. "'Silly boy!' muttered the prelate. 
Luis is always prattling with that girl. I thought better of the fair sex till of late. He spoke these words as his eyes caught his page, chattering at the door with a dark-eyed Creole servant-maid of the De Solis family. Presently the bishop clapped his hands, and a domestic entered. Send Luis to me. When the page came up, the old man greeted him with a half-smile. Well, my son, I wish my chocolate to be brought me. I could not think of breaking off that long tete-a-tete -tete with Dolores, but this is past the proper time. Your holiness will pardon me, said the lad. Dolores brought you a present from the Donna de Solis. The lady sends her humble respects to your holiness and requests your acceptance of a large packet of very beautiful chocolate. I am much obliged to her, said the bishop. Did you express to the maiden my thanks? Luis bowed. Then, child, you may prepare me a cup of this chocolate and bring it me at once. The Donna de Solis's chocolate? Yes, my son, yes. When the boy had left the room, the old man clasped his hands with an expression of thankfulness. They are going to yield. This is a sign that they are desiring reconciliation. Next day the cathedral was thronged with ladies. The service proceeded as usual, but the bishop was not present. How is the bishop? was whispered from one lady to another with conscience glances, till the query reached the ears of one of the canons who was at the door. His holiness is very ill, he answered. He has retired to the monastery of St. James. What is the matter with him? He is suffering from severe pains internally. Has he seen a doctor? Physicians have been sent for. For eight days the good old prelate lingered in great suffering. Tell me, he asked very feebly, tell me truly what is my complaint. Your holiness has been poisoned, replied the physician. The bishop turned his face to the wall. Someone whispered that he was dead when he had been thus for some while. The dying man turned his face round and said, Hush, I am praying for my poor sheep. May God pardon them. Then, after a pause, I forgive them for having caused my death, most heartily. Poor sheep. And he died. Since then there has been a proverb prevalent in Mexico, Beware of tasting chapa chocolate. Gage, the Dominican, did not remain long in Chapa after the death of his patron. He seldom touched chocolate in that town unless quite certain of the friendship of those who offered it to him, and when he did leave it was from fear of a fate like the bishop's, he having incurred the anger of some of the ladies. The cathedral presented the same scene as before, the prelate had laboured in vain, and chocolate was copiously drunk at his funeral. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of Curiosities of Olden Times」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Capricia Page Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gould Chapter 18 The Philosopher's Stone There are many ways, says Del Rio, in which the Philosopher's Stone is made. Writers contest with each other which is the right way. Polandimus opposes the opinions of Brachius. Valencinus will have none of those of Trevanius. So one assails another, and all call each other foolish and ignorant. But however they may have disputed how to make it, no one succeeded in finding the right way. For no one knew where to look for it, and yet the philosopher's stone was before all their eyes, to be enjoyed by all alike, but to be appropriated by none. This precious stone, which went by various names, the universal elixir, 
the elixir of life, the water of the sun, was thought to procure its happy discoverer and possessor riches innumerable, perpetual health, a life exempt from all maladies and cares and pains, and even in the opinion of some, immortality. It transmuted lead into gold, glass into diamonds, it opened locks, it penetrated everywhere. It was the sovereign remedy to all disease. It was luminous in the dark night. To fashion it, so the alchemist said, gold and lead, iron, antimony, vitriol, sulfur, mercury, arsenic, water, fire, earth, and air were needed. To these must be added the egg of a cock and the spittle of doves. Really, said one shrewd and satiric writer, it only wanted oil, vinegar, and salt to make a salad of it. Now the curious thing is, as we shall see in the sequel, the alchemists were not far out of their opinion. All of these ingredients, or rather most of them, the cock's egg and the dove's spittle only excepted, are to be found combined in the philosopher's stone, and only recent science has established this fact. As the possessor of this stone was sure to be the most glorious, powerful, rich, and happy of mortals, as he could at will convert anything into gold, and enjoy all the pleasures of life, it is not surprising that the philosopher's stone was sought with eagerness. It was sought, but, as already said, never found, because the alchemists looked for it, in just the place where it was not to be found, in their crucibles. Metals were struck on which were inscribed Persal, Sulphur, Mercurium, Phytolopis, Philosophorium, which was a simplification of the receipt. On the reverse stood Thou Alpha and Omega of life, hope and resurrection after death. It was identified with Solomon's seal. It was called Orphanus, the one and only. It was thought at one time that the emperor had it in his crown, this Orphanus, and that it blazed like the sun at night. But the German emperors enjoyed so little prosperity that philosophers came to conclude that the stone in the imperial crown was something quite different. It brought ill luck rather than good fortune. Zosimus, who lived in the beginning of the fifth century, is one of the first in Europe to describe the powers of the stone and its capacity for making gold and silver. The alchemists pretended to derive their science from Shem, or Chem, the son of Noah, and that thence came the name alchemy and chemistry. All writers upon alchemy triumphantly cite the story of the golden calf in the thirty-second chapter of Exodus to prove that Moses was an adept and could make or unmake gold at his pleasure. It is recorded that Moses was so wroth with the Israelites for their idolatry that he took the calf, which they made and burned it in the fire, and ground it into powder, and strewed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. This, say the alchemist, he never could have done had he not been in possession of the philosopher's stone. By no other means could he have made the powder of gold float upon the water. At Constantinople, in the fourth century, the transmutation of metals was very generally believed in, and many treatises upon the subject appeared. Linguet du Fesnoy, in his history of hermetic philosophy, gives some account of these works. The notion of the Greek writers seems to have been that all metals were composed of two ingredients, the one metallic matter and the other red, inflammable matter that they call sulphur. The pure union of these substances formed gold, but other metals were mixed with and contaminated by various foreign ingredients. The object of the philosopher's stone was to dissolve and expel these base ingredients, and so to liberate the two original constituents whose marriage produced gold. For several centuries after the pursuit flagged or slept in Europe, but it reappeared in the eighth century among the Arabians, and from them re-extended to Europe. 
we are not going to trace the history of alchemy downwards and see one student after another wreck his genius and time on this rock but see what use was made of the belief in it by impostors to enrich themselves at the expense of the credulous we will follow the superstition upwards and track the stone to the spring of the belief in its supernatural powers the search for the stone will take us through strange country give us many scrambles but if the reader will condescend to accompany me i believe i shall be able to bring him to the very real and original stone itself the following story i give as it was told to me by some yorkshire mill lasses in their own delightful vernacular i will forewarn the reader that the golden ball in the story is the same as the philosopher's stone as you shall hear presently there were two lasses daughters of one mother and as they came home from the fair they saw a right bonny young man stand in the house door before them he had gold on the cap gold on the finger gold on the neck a red gold chain watch ay but he had brass he had a gold ball in each hand he gave a ball to each lass and she was to keep it and if she lost it she was to be hanged one of the lasses twas the youngest lost her ball she was by a park palling and she tossed the ball and it went up up and up till it went over the palling and when she climbed to look the ball ran along green grass and it went right forward to the door of the house and the ball went in and she saw it no more so she was taken away to be hanged by the neck till she were dead because she lost her ball but she had a sweetheart and he said he would get the ball so he went to the park gate but twas shut so he climbed hedge and when he got to the top of hedge an old woman rose out of the dyke afore him and said if he would get ball he must sleep three nights in the house he said he would then he went into the house and looked for the ball but couldn't find it night came on and he heard spirits move in the courtyard so he looked out of the window and the yard was full of them like maggots of rotten meat presently he heard steps coming upstairs he hid behind the door and was still as a mouse then in came a giant five times as tall as he and the giant looked around but did not see the lad so he went to the window and bowed to look out and as he bowed on his elbow to see spirits in the yard the lad stepped behind him and with one blow of his sword he cut him in twain so the top of him fell into the yard and the bottom part stood looking out of the window and there was a great cry from the spirits when they saw half the giant tumbling down to them and they called out there comes half our master give us the other half so the lad said tis no use of thee thou pair of legs standing alone in the window so go join thy brother and he cast the bottom part of the giant after top part now when the spirit had gotten all the giant they was quiet next night the lad was at the house again and saw a second giant come in the door and as he came in the lad cut him in twain but the legs walked on to the chimney and went up it go get thee after thy legs said the lad to the head and he cast the head up the chimney too the third night the lad got into the bed and he heard the spirits stirring under the bed and they had the ball there and they was casting it to and fro now one of them had his leg trussing out from under the bed so the lad brings his sword down and cuts it off then another thrusts his arm out at the other side of the bed and the lad cuts that off so at last he had maimed them all and they all went crying and wailing off and forgot them all and let it lig there under the bed and the lad took it and went to seek his true love footnote the portion within brackets i got from a different informant the first version was incomplete the girls had forgotten how the ball was recovered they forgot also what happened with the second ball now the last was taken to york to be hanged she was brought out on the scaffold and the hangman said now lass thou must be hanged by the neck till thou beest dead 
but she cried out, Stop, stop, I think I see my mother coming. O mother, hast thou brought my golden ball, and come to set me free? I've neither brought thy golden ball, nor come to set thee free, but I have come to see thee hung upon the gallow tree. Then the hangman said, Now, lass, say thy prayers, for thou must dee. But she said, Stop, stop, I think I see my father coming. O oh, father, hast thou brought my golden ball, and come to set me free? I have neither brought thy golden ball, nor come to set thee free, but I have come to see thee hung upon the gallows tree. Then the hangman said, Hast thee done thy prayers? Now, lass, put thy head into the noose. And she answered, Stop, stop, I think I see my brother coming, etc. After which she excused herself, which she thought she saw her sister coming, and her uncle, then her aunt, then her cousin, each of which was related in full. After which the hangman said, I won't stop no longer. That's making game of me. But now she saw her sweetheart coming through the crowd, and he held overhead in the air her own golden ball. So she said, Stop, stop, I see my sweetheart coming. Sweetheart has brought my golden ball, and come to set me free. Aye, I have brought thy golden ball, and come to set thee free. I have not come to see thee hung upon this gallows tree. In this very curious story, the portion within the brackets reminds one of the German story of Fearless John in Grimm, of which I remember obtaining an English variant in a chapbook in Exeter when I was a child, alas, now lost. It is also found in Iceland, and is indeed a widely spread tale. The verses are like others found in Essex in connection with a child's game of Mary Brown and those of the Swedish Fair Gundula. But these points we must pass over. Our interest attaches specially to the golden ball. This story is almost certainly the remains of an old religious myth. The golden ball which one sister has is the sun. The silver ball of the other sister is the moon. The sun is lost. It sets and the trolls, the spirits of darkness, play with it under the bed, that is, in the house of darkness, beneath the earth. But the sun is not only a golden ball, but it is also a shining stone, and here, at the outset, we tell our secret. The sun is the true philosopher's stone, and turns all to gold, which gives health and fills with joy. In primeval times our rude forefathers were puzzled how to explain the nature of sun and moon and stars, and they thought they had hit on the interpretation of the phenomenon when they said that the stars were diamonds struck in the heavenly vault, and that the sun was a luminous stone, a carbuncle, and the moon a pearl or a silver disk. Even the classic writers have not shaken off this notion, and Nexagoria, Democritus, Metrodorus, all speak of the sun as a glowing stone, and Orpheus calls the opal the sunstone because of its analogy to that shining ball. So Pliny also. The old Norse spoke of the stars as the gemstones of heaven, so did the Anglo-Saxons. But perhaps the clearest idea we can have of the old cosmogony is the pictures preserved to us of the world of the dwarfs. When a superior conception of the universe was general, then the old heathen idea sank, and what had been told of the world of men was referred to the underground world, peopled by the dwarves, who were the representatives of the early race conquered by the Britons, and by the Norse and the Teuton, a race probably of Turanian origin. Our British and Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian forefathers knew of the cosmogony of the conquered race, and came to suppose that they inhabited another world to them, a world of which the vault had overarched, it was set with precious stones, and as the aboriginal inhabitants were driven to live in caves, or in huts, heaped over with turf so as to be like mounds, they regarded them as a subterranean people, and their world would be underground. In a multitude of stories the trolls or dwarves are said to live in tumuli or cairns. This is nothing more than that their hovels were made of sticks stuck in the ground, gathered together in the middle and turfed over. The lap hut, even the Icelandic farmhouse, 
look like grass mounds. In many tales we hear of human children carried off by the dwarves, and when these children are recovered they tell of a world in which they have been, where the light is given by diamonds, and a great carbuncle set in a stony black vault. William of Newburgh says that wolf pits near Stow Market in Suffolk were some of these ancient trenches. Out of these trenches there once came, in harvest time, two children, a boy and a girl, whose bodies were of a green color, and who wore dresses of some unknown stuff. They were caught and taken to the village, where for many months they would eat nothing but beans. They gradually lost their green color. The boy soon died. The girl survived and was married to a man of Lynn. At first they could speak no English. But when they were able to do so, they said that they belonged to the land of St. Martin, an unknown country, where, as they were once watching their father's sheep, they heard a loud noise like a ringing of the bells of St. Edmund's Monastery. And then, all at once, they found themselves among the reapers at Wolfpit. Their country was a Christian land and had churches. There was no sun there, only a faint twilight. But beyond a broad river there lay a land of light. Geraldus Cabrinus, in his Itinerary of Wales, tells another queer story of the underground world, and notices that some of the words used in it are closely related to the British tongue. But in neither story are the sun and the stars spoken of as stones encrusting the vault. The underground rose garden of Lauren the Dwarf, by Botson, is, however, illumined by one great carbuncle the same sunstone. A white, marvellous stone reappears in the Grail story, which is from beginning to end a Christianized Celtic myth. In it the Grail is originally not invariably a basin or goblet, but a stone. It is so in Wolfren von Eschenbach's Parsifal, in that there is no thought of it as a chalice. It is a stone which feeds and delights all who surround, cherish, and venerate it. Whosoever the earth produces, whosoever exhales, whatever is good and sweet in drink and meat that yields the precious stone that never fails. In the Elder Eda, in the Fiel Vinsmal, Schwibdager is represented by climbing to the golden halls of heaven, and when he comes there he asks who reigns in that place. The answer given to him is, Mingald is her name. She here holds sway, and has power over these lands and glorious halls. Now Mingald means she who rejoices in the men, the precious stone that is the sun. She is the holder of the sun, as in the Yorkshire tale, the lass holds the golden ball. Matthew Parrish says that King Richard Cure de Lyon was wont to tell the following story. A rich and miserly Venetian, whose name was Vitalis, was wandering in a forest in quest of game for his table, as he was about to give his daughter in marriage. He fell into a pit that had been prepared for wild beasts, and on reaching the bottom found there a lion and a serpent. They did not injure him. By chance, a charcoal burner came that way and heard the lamentations of those in the pit. Moved with pity, he fetched a rope and ladder and released all three. The lion, full of gratitude, brought the collier meat. The serpent brought him a precious stone. The Venetian thanked him and promised him a reward if he would come to his house. The poor man did so. When Vitalis refused to acknowledge any debt and threw the collier into prison, However, he escaped, and went with the lion and the serpent before the magistrates, and told them the tale, and showed them the jewel given him by the serpent. The magistrates thereupon ordered Vitalis to pay to the collier a reasonable reward. The poor man also sold the jewel for a very large sum. Richard must have heard the story in the East, there are no lions, in the Venetian territory. Moreover, the story is incomplete. We have the same story in a fuller version in the Gesta Romanorum. A Senesco rode through a wood and fell into a pit, in which there was an ape 
a lion, and a serpent. A woodcutter saved them all. Next day, the woodcutter went to the castle for the promised reward, but received instead a cudgelding. The following day, the lion drove to him ten laden asses, and he had them and the treasure they bore. Next day, as he was collecting wood and had no axe, the ape brought him boughs with which he laid his ass. On the third day, the serpent brought him a stone of three colors, by the virtue of which he won all hearts, and came to such honor that he was appointed general in command of the emperor's armies, and when the emperor heard of the stone, he bought it of the woodcutter. However, the stone always returned to the original owner, however often he parted with it. The same story occurs in Gower's Confessio Armantis. The story spread through Europe and is found in most collection of household tales. It occurs in Grimm's Kindermachen, number 24, and Basili's Book of Neapolitan Tales, The Pentameron, number 37. All these were derived from the East and were brought to Europe by the Crusaders. The story occurs in various Oriental collections. The Pali tale is as follows. In a time of drought, a dog, a serpent, and a man fell into a pit together. An inhabitant of the Baronies draws them up in a basket, and they all promise him tokens of gratitude. The man of Baronies falls into great poverty. The dog thereupon steals the king's crown whilst he is bathing, and brings it to his preserver. The man who has been helped by the other betrays him, and the preserver is imprisoned. The poor man is about to be impaled when the serpent bites the queen, and the king learns that she can only be cured by the man who is on his way to execution. So the poor fellow is brought before the prince, and the whole story comes out. In this version the stone does not appear, nor does it in the Sanskrit Panchant Antra, but in the Mongol Siddhitkar, number 13, we have the stone again. A Brahmin delivers a mouse from children who teased it, then an ape, and lastly a bear. He falls into trouble and is put in a wooden box and thrown into the sea. The mouse comes and nibbles a hole in the box, through which he can breathe, and the ape raises the lid, and the bear tears it off. Then the ape gives him a wondrous stone, which gives him who has it power to do and have all he wishes. With this he wishes himself on land, then builds a palace, and surrounds himself with servants. A caravan passes, and the leader is amazed to see the new palace, buys the stone of the man, and at once with it goes all the luck and splendor, and the Brahmin is where he was at first. Again the thankful beasts come to his aid. The mouse creeps into the palace of the new owner of the stone and discovers where he hides it. And with the aid of the bear and the ape, it is again recovered. Here we have the serpent omitted, which is the principal animal to be considered, for really the serpent is the owner of the stone that grows in its head. This idea is very general, that the carbuncle is to be found in the serpent's head. Pliny has this notion. Indeed, it is found everywhere. The origin of the myth is that the great serpent is the heaven god, and on the Gnostic seals we have the demiurge so represented as a crowned or nimmed serpent. In the head of this great heaven god is the sun, the glorious stone that gives life and light and gladness and plenty. In the West the story is told that the emperor Theodosius hung in his palace a bell and all who needed his help were to ring the bell. One day a snake came and pulled the bell. The emperor, who was blind, came out to inquire who needed him. Then he learned that a toad had invaded the nest of the serpent, so he ordered the toad to be removed. The next day the grateful serpent brought the emperor a costly stone, and bade him lay it on his eyes. When he did this he recovered his sight. The same story is told of Charlemagne. He was summoned to judge between a toad and a serpent, and decided for the latter. In gratitude the snake brought the emperor a precious stone. 
Charles gave it, set it in a ring to his wife, Fastrada. It had the power to attract love. Thenceforth he was inseparable from Fastrada, and when she died, he would not leave her body. They carried it about with him for eighteen years. Then a courtier removed the jewel and flung it into a hot spring at Aix-la-Chapelle. Thenceforth the emperor loved Aix above every spot in the world and would never leave it. In the story of Erisilius, the hero finds a stone that has the power of preserving the bearer from injury by water. Erisilius, armed with this stone, lies at the bottom of the Tiber as one asleep and is not drowned. In Barlam and Jehoshaphat, the hermit undertakes to give his pupil a stone which will afford light to the blind, wisdom to fools, hearing to the deaf, and speech to the dumb. There is a strange story in the Talmud of a serpent that has a stone which gives life. A man goes in quest of it. The serpent tries to swallow the ship in which he sails. Then comes a raven and bites off the serpent's head, and the sea is made red with its blood. A dragon catches the falling stone and touches the dead serpent with it. It revives and again attacks the ship. Then another bird kills the creature, and this time the man catches the stone. The power of the stone is so great that it revived salted birds that lay on the table ready to be eaten, and they flew away. In Buddhist stories, the original signification of the marvelous stone is completely lost, as completely as in the European medieval stories. The Indian Buddhist remembered that there was a wondrous stone of which strange stories had been told, and which possessed the most surprising powers, and they made use of the idea to illustrate their doctrine. The stone was no other than the secret of Buddha. He who attained to that was rich, happy, serene. It was called the, the Sinktamane, that is, the wishing stone, because he who has it has everything that can be desired. In the Buddhist collection of stories entitled The Wise Man and the Fool is the tale of the king's son, Gidon, who grieved at the misery there is in the world, goes in the quest of the Sinktamani. He takes with him his brother Digdon. They reach a castle where he is warned to strike at the door with a diamond bat. Then five hundred goddesses will come forth, each bearing a precious stone, but only one of these is the wishing stone. He must select the stone without speaking. He does so and chooses the right one. On his way home, on board ship, a storm arises, and he is wrecked, but as he bears the precious stone he is not drowned, and he saves his brother. Digdon, envious, steals the stone, and puts out his brother's eyes and goes home. Gidon follows, forgives his brother, recovers the stone and his sight. Elsewhere the wishing stone is described as giving light by night as well as by day, as far as one hundred and twenty voices could be heard calling, and one catching and repeating to another and by this light could be seen the seven kinds of treasures falling from heaven like a rain, which are offered to all. The idea of the marvelous, luminous, enriching, health-giving stone remains, its original significance absolutely lost, and is given a new spell of life, in that it is used as a symbol of the teaching of Buddha. In Europe, also, the idea of the marvelous stone remains. It is not used allegorically, except in the Grail myth, but it haunts men's minds. They believe in it. They suppose it must be found. And they try to manufacture it out of all kinds of ingredients. Footnote. I said at the beginning of this article that the alchemists were right in believing the philosopher's stone to be complex made up of many metals. We know now that the germ idea of the stone is the sun, 
and the spectroscope allows us to analyze the sun's light and discover in the solar atmosphere a multitude of metals and ingredients in fusion. Neither Arab nor European alchemist nor Buddhist recluse dreamed that the stone that gave light, that nourished, that rejoiced, that enriched, was the sun shining above their heads. The conception of the sun as a stone was so old, so rolled and rubbed down, that they had no notion whence it came. The idea remained and influenced their mind strangely, but it never occurred to them to ask whence the idea derived. There is something pitiful in looking at the wasted lives of those old seekers bowed over their crucibles, inhaling noxious vapors, wearing out the nights in fruitless experiment. But, like all history, that of the alchemist teaches us a lesson to look up instead of looking down, a lesson to seek happiness, wealth, contentment, in the simple and not the complex, in light instead of in darkness. I believe that this is the only one of my articles in which I have drawn a moral, but the moral is so obvious that it would have been inexcusable had I passed it over. But I know that as a child I resented the applications in Aesop's fables, and perhaps my readers will feel a like objection in having a moral appended to this essay. That I might dismiss him with a smile instead of a frown, I will close with a copy of verses extracted by me some thirty or more years ago from, I think, a Cambridge University undergraduate's magazine, verses probably new to my readers. But as they enforce the same moral in a perfectly fresh and charming manner, and as they deserve to be rescued from oblivion, I conclude with them. I was just five years old that December, and a fine little promising boy, so my grandmother said I remember, and gave me a strange-looking toy. In its shape it was lengthy and round, it was papered with yellow and blue, one end with a glass top was bounded, at the other a hole to look through. Dear Granny, what's this? I came crying. A box for my pencils? But see, I can't open it hard enough. I'm trying. Oh, what is it? What can it be? Why, my dear, if you're only looking through it, and stand with your face in the light, turn it gently. That's just how to do it, and you'll see a remarkable sight. Oh, how beautiful! cried I, delighted, as I saw each fantastic device. The bright fragments now closely united, all falling apart in a thrice. Times have passed, and new years will now find me, each birthday no longer a boy, yet methinks that their turns may remind me of the turns of my grandmother's toy. For in all this world, with its beauties, its pictures so bright and so fair, you may vary the pleasures and duties, but still the same pieces are there. From the time that the earth was first founded, there has never been anything new. The same thoughts, the same things have redounded, till the colors have palled on the view. But, though all that is old is returning, there is yet in the sameness a change and new truths are the wise ever learning, for the patterns must always be strange. Shall we say that our days are all weary, all labor and sorrow and care, that its pleasures and joys are but dreary, mere phantoms that vanish in air? Ah, no! There are some darker pieces, and others transparent and bright, but this, surely, the beauty increases, only stand with your face in the light, and to the treasures for which you are yearning, those joys, now succeeded by pain, are but spangles just hid in the turning, 
they will come to the surface again. B. So the old ideas, old myths, are turned and turned about, and form new combinations, and are ever evolving fresh beauties, and teaching fresh truths. Perhaps in the consideration of these ancient myths, and seeing their progressive modifications, their breaking up, their coalitions, we may find the fresh application of the old saw that there is nothing new under the sun. End of chapter 18 Recording by Capricia Page End of Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gould